optimal approach to first line treatment of myelofibrosis has changed dramatically uh, over time. Of course, in 2011, we had the introduction of ruxolitinib and, and that dramatically changed things. Uh, first a drug FDA approved for the treatment of myelofibrosis. So obviously a big deal, a, a, a land mark change in the treatment of myelofibrosis. And for the longest time, all we had was ruxolitinib as, as a main tool. And so we thought about how to stretch it and apply it and keep it going. But now we're getting more and more drugs. So was approved and now pacritinib was also approved. So we have three jack inhibitors that are approved. And so it's obviously much more complicated nowadays. And you kind of think about what's going on with the patient. So thinking about first line treatment, I kind of think about what is the most pressing issue with the patient? Is it spleen burden? Is it symptoms and those types of things, or is it maybe anemia? So as many of you know, anemia is a prevalent issue in myelofibrosis. Roughly 40% of patients will have anemia at the time of diagnosis and another 40 to 50% may become transfusion dependent within the first year after diagnosis. So if anemia is the main issue and the patient is relatively asymptomatic, I tend to use anemia directed therapy from the beginning, such as erythropoiesis stimulating agents, Lucepatercept or Danazol as kind of the first go-to there. Uh, in, in these situations too, sometimes imids like lenalidomide are considered as well. But if the patient's main concern is spleen size and symptom burden, certainly jack inhibitor therapy is warranted. I think for patients with very preserved bone marrow function who have adequate hemoglobin and platelet count levels, uh, using ruxolitinib is still the standard approach. Uh, and, and dosing based on what the package insert suggests uh, it, it is definitely the approach I take. In patients who are somewhat myelosuppressed, say they're, they're quite anemic, or certainly those with platelet counts less than 50,000, uh, we think about pacritinib now, uh, because the main thrust of pacritinib is that it can deliver jack inhibition without totally trashing the platelet counts, and so, as well as anemia too, a, a lack of a, a, a suppression of erythropoiesis. And so I think that that's how we kind of fit things in, in the front line. So ruxolitinib for the more preserved and pacritinib for those who are more myelodeplete or cytopenic. Pacritinib uh, fit into all this. Um, is this, do we put fedratinib in the midline, kind of in the 50 to 100 platelet count range? Is there a role over ruxolitinib there? It's, it's a little unclear, I think, at this point. And certainly momolotinib is on the horizon for approval. And how will that fit in? Do we specifically focus on anemic patients with momolotinib or use it more broadly? I think um, as these drugs come to market, it's going to get more and more complicated. And then lastly, with other drugs like pelabresib on the horizon in combination with ruxolitib, how will that fit in the front line? So I think for those of us who serve on guideline panels, uh, it's an exciting time with all these new agents coming along, but certainly things are gonna get very complicated here in the near future.